of today's session is a very complex one and a very delicate one. Confronting human suffering with God. Now, of course, inevitably, as those who participated in the last session will undoubtedly recall, this is a sequel to the question of confronting evil with God. But when we speak of human suffering, there are obviously many additional questions that arise, questions for which I feel compelled to state at the outset, we don't really have answers in this world. And yet still and all, I think there is a lot to discuss. A lot to discuss in particular based upon the premise that this confrontation with human suffering, just as the confrontation with evil, is something we do with God. And inevitably it is being with God that informs everything we have to say. And of course, most of all, our being with God and His Word as He revealed it in the Bible. So with that, by way of introduction, let's take a look at the questions. The questions have been culled from really a number of sources, a number of inquiries that have been sent in. And I think they provide us with a very good handle in addressing the question and the problems that go with it. Number one, confronting human suffering with God. Why do the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper? How can a just and loving God allow such a brutal miscarriage of justice to take place in his world? Now, in particular, of course, in considering human suffering, there is very obviously a book of the Bible dedicated almost entirely to addressing this subject, and that is the book of Job. Question two, the book of Job seems to try to address these questions, but it is very hard to understand what answer, if any, it gives. Is Job's suffering justified or not? What does this book of the Bible come to teach us? And in particular, if we realize, and we must realize, that the book of Job tells us that Job's suffering is not something that can be formally associated with crimes that he committed, then we get to question number three, pertaining to pretty much everything else that we see in the Bible on the subject. Many other passages in the Bible promise good reward to the righteous and punishment to the wicked. In other words, in a word, justice. Is this a contradiction? That is, if the book of Job indicates that the suffering of Job is not punishment to the wicked, then what's going on? What is it? And can such promises, again, the promises of good reward to the righteous and punishment to the wicked, can such promises be real when so often we see exactly the opposite? So, these are our questions, and inevitably, we need to try to address what the problems are that they raise and somehow, if not resolve them, at least be able to maybe deal with them better. 
Now, the first point that inevitably I feel compelled to stress here is the issue of our asking this question in the first place. In our the first prophet whom we cite here is Jeremiah. In chapter 12, in verses 1 and 2, Jeremiah complains to God of the wicked people with whom he needs to deal. Right would you be, O God, were I to contend with you? Yet I will reason with you. Wherefore does the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they secure to deal very treacherously? You have planted them. They have taken root. They grow. They bear fruit. But you are near in their mouths and far from their reins, from their innards. Why do you give them such prosperity? And of course, similarly, the message of the book of Jonah in chapter 4 is essentially precisely this. The people of Nineveh, argues Jonah, are still basically wicked. They don't deserve the reprieve that God is giving them. And so, in chapter 4, verse 2, Jonah prays to God, I pray, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my own land? Therefore I fled beforehand to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and compassionate, long-suffering and abundant in mercy, and repent of the evil. And Jonah is so disturbed by the prosperity of people who don't deserve it, he asks to die. Therefore now, O God, take, I beseech you, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Certainly we see the prophets, Abraham, Jeremiah, Jonah, troubled by these very issues. And in considering what at first brush what might appear to be the simple answer, the superficial answer, it's all a matter of inscrutable divine justice. That is, we don't understand, but that really is what is taking place. Much the same argument that is indeed advanced in the book of Job by Job's friends. In chapter 4, in verses 6 and on, we read the argument of his friend Eliphaz, who says to Job, is not your fear of God your confidence, your hope, the integrity of your ways. It is your righteousness that will save you. Remember, I pray you, who ever perished being innocent? Or where were the upright cut off? According as I have seen, they that plow iniquity and sow mischief reap the same. By the breath of God they perish, and by the blast of his anger are they consumed. What inspiring words to be able to explain all suffering as divine justice at work. The only problem is it doesn't work. That's not my evaluation. God says it doesn't work. At the end of the book of Job, in chapter 42, from verse 7 and on, we read, and it was so that after God had spoken these words to Job, that God said to Eliphaz, those words we just read in chapter 4, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job did. Job, 
came awfully close to blasphemy. He refused to accept any reconciliation with God. He demanded an answer. And he wasn't prepared to accept the answer that if he's suffering, it's because he deserves it. And God says, Job spoke of me more correctly than his self-righteous friends excusing, so to speak. God as always being just. And indeed, God continues in verse 7, Now therefore, take unto you seven bullocks, seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you. For him I will favor, that I do not unto you anything unseemly. For you have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job. And so they do what God commanded them, and God favored Job, but not Eliphaz and his friends. Simple, superficial answers won't do. They are, in fact, an affront to God. Not only are they an affront to God, but I feel compelled to add, in our tradition, giving such answers in explaining suffering is actually an outright sin. In Leviticus chapter 25, verse 17, we read of the sin, the prohibition. You shall not wrong one another, but you shall fear God, for I am God your Lord. In our tradition, this prohibition pertains to verbally wronging someone, saying something hurtful, saying something unseemly. The classic example in our tradition is saying to someone experiencing suffering what Job's friends said to him. Oh, it's all divine justice. That's not an answer. That's an insult. It's an affront to the person suffering, and it's an affront to God. So, again, clearly that won't suffice. And yet, at the same time, we recognize that one of the most ubiquitous themes in the Bible is divine justice, reward, and punishment. Now, to start giving an exhaustive list here of every place in the Bible where we read about reward and punishment is something uh, we could do, but we would never finish. There are so many passages. So for the purposes of our discussion, I'm just going to share with you Deuteronomy chapter 11. This is, I must admit, for Jews, a particularly glaring example, because this is a passage that, in our tradition, we recite at least twice every single day. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, beginning in verse 13, it shall come to pass, if you hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love God your Lord, to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give the rain of your land in its season, the former rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain, your wine, your oil, and I will give grass in your fields for your cattle, and you shall eat and be satisfied. But take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods, and prostrate yourselves before them, and the anger of God will be kindled against you, and he will shut the heavens so that there will be no rain, and the ground will not yield her produce, and you will be lost quickly from off the good land that God gives you. Reward and punishment. And indeed, as we've noted, this is one of the foundational themes in Moses' song. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4, God is the rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are justice. 
a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. So, of course, inevitably, the first question that we cannot help but address here is that question that we saw about a seeming contradiction. Do you have a book of the Bible, the book of Job, that seems to indicate that what's happening does not conform to rules of reward and punishment? Because after all, Job is explicitly described as a righteous man. And then you have all these passages of which the two examples in Deuteronomy are merely a brief sample that speak of everything in terms of reward and punishment. So what are we to do? How do we understand the Bible's message here? What's taking place? Of course, inevitably, when we consider the tension between these sources, the key, much as we might prefer to avoid it, lies in recognizing just how limited our perspective is. Perhaps a good way to address this observation first is by considering a relatively familiar Hebrew word, certainly for all the Hebraic scholars there among you, and that is the Hebrew word olam. Olam in the Bible means everlasting or forever, as in Genesis chapter 21, verse 33, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there in the name of God, the everlasting God. Likewise, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 15, here it is God who is speaking. God said, moreover, to Moses, thus shall you say to the people of Israel, God, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, forever in the Hebrew, le'olam, and my memorial unto all generations. The reason I'm calling our attention to this word is because while in biblical Hebrew, it means forever, everlasting. In post-biblical Hebrew, it takes on a new definition. It means the world, the universe. There is obviously a connection here. But the connection, ironically, forces us to consider what we have had occasion to consider on many occasions in the past, and that is the three-letter root that, after all, underlies all original Hebrew words, and in the case of olam, is alam, ayin, lamed, mem, are the root letters for the Hebrew experts. What does the root mean? The root, alam, is hidden, concealed. Now, in the original sense of olam as forever, we can, I think, appreciate the connection. That is, forever is always going to be concealed from us. We live in the here and now. We don't see the forever. We don't see the everlasting. That's, of course, one dimension. Of course, the truth is, we don't see the world, the universe. What is really essential is concealed. The universe is a realm of hiding. Of course, on the most basic plane, God is hiding. But expanding on that, whatever we think we see is merely the surface. Underneath it all, 
it remains an enigma for us. Indeed, in this vein, we noted last time as well, the last verse in Genesis chapter 1, verse that speaks of God's final assessment of the process of creation. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And it was evening, and it was morning, the sixth day. And the critical nuance that once again we stress here is that when you look at everything, you see that it is indeed very good. When you look at the particulars as particulars, you can't see very good. At times you can't say good at all. There are things in the world that in a very immediate, tangible way, unequivocally are bad. But if you can see the whole picture, if you could see as God sees, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. When you see everything, you can see that. Of course, inevitably, the problem is that to see everything that God made, you would have to be God. As expressed in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says God. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Indeed, we're not going to understand. And the truth is that with that realization, we appreciate that this is indeed a central aspect of God's message to Job, and maybe a critical component in our grappling with what might otherwise appear to be a contradiction between the book of Job and the principle of reward and punishment. There's no contradiction. Reward and punishment are real. Just we may not be able to understand it. In Job chapter 38, beginning in verse 1, Then God answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now your loins like a man, for I will ask you and declare you unto me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined the measures thereof, if you know? Who stretched the line upon it? Whereupon were the foundations of it fastened? Who laid the cornerstone of it? And what follows is a list of additional challenges, just excerpting briefly. In verse 12, have you commanded the morning since your days began? and caused the dawn to know its place? Have you entered into the springs of the sea? Have you walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? Have you surveyed unto the breadth of the earth? Tell if you know it all. Where is the way of the dwelling of light? And as for darkness, where is the place thereof? you know it? For you were then born, and the number of your days is great. You do. And the challenges continue because of the limitations of time. We won't read the entire passage. Just skipping to chapter 40. Moreover, God answered Job and said, Shall he who reproves contend with the Almighty, he that argues with God, let him answer it. Then Job answered God and said, 
Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer again, yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. And God continues to lay it in, in challenging Job out of the whirlwind. And finally, ultimately, we get to chapter 42. Job's final answer. In verse 1, then Job answered God and said, I know that you can do everything, and that no purpose can be withheld from you. Who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I told, but did not understand things too wonderful for me, and I did not know. Here I beseech you, and I will speak. I will ask you and declare you unto me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Wherefore I abhor my words and repent, seeing dust and ashes. We think, we understand. But if we don't understand, then at the very least we can strive to understand. If we don't have all the answers, we can get all the answers. We can. Our pretensions of omniscience, our thinking that we can know all, that is our undoing. Now, when we consider more specifically what that means, wherein our problems lie. Of course, on the most basic plane, when we speak about God, it is axiomatic by definition. We speak of one who transcends the bounds of time and space. We transcend. We are limited by time and limited by space. Indeed, as expressed in Psalm 90, verse 4, a thousand years in your sight are as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in them. Our window through which we see, so narrow, so limited. So of course, inevitably, once we appreciate the extent to which our vision is so narrow, our field of view so piddling, do we really expect to be able to understand you know, when one considers the vastness of time, we indeed believe reward and punishment are real. They will come to fulfillment. But not necessarily in the time frame that we expect. I feel compelled to share with you a brief passage from a poem by a very well-known American poet of the 19th century, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Retribution. Though the mills of God grind slowly, yet they grind exceeding small. Though with patience he stands waiting, with exactness grinds he all. But again, we may not be around to observe it. A thousand years in your sight are as yesterday when it is past. And it's watching the night.
So of course, this is inevitably on one thing, our limitations. It's an additional dimension as well. The additional dimension pertains perhaps most jarringly to the question of what is reward and what is punishment? That is, sure, we believe that God rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. Can we even tell what the reward is and what the punishment is? In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, in verse 12, we read, There is a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun, namely, riches kept by the owner thereof to his hurt. And those riches perish by evil adventure, and he will beget a son who will have nothing in his hand. So there can be riches. And while we may superficially think that those riches are a blessing, in fact, they're a curse. And conversely, in Isaiah chapter 12, in verse 1, in that day you will say, I will give thanks unto you, O God, for you were angry with me. When your anger is turned away, you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation, I will trust and will not be afraid. For God the Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Now, this is a rather strange turn of phrase, and indeed in many translations it's somewhat different. But the simple reading of the Hebrew is, I thank you because you were angry with me. What is it talking about? And I feel compelled to share with you an insight in our tradition that's accompanied by an anecdote, a story. It's a story that I'm sure on many levels is both familiar with all of us and a source of great vexation. The story is someone who was on his way to a really important business trip, a voyage by ship, and something happens, he hurts his foot, he misses the boat, and he's convinced. God's out to get him. He's just suffering all the opportunities that he anticipated, lost. What punishment? Until sometime afterward, he learns that the ship went down at sea all hands on board. And of course then realizes that what he had thought was punishment was in fact reward. It was blessing. So if you can't tell what reward is and what blessing is, what punishment is and what cursing is, can you really evaluate what's going on in the world? Our perceptions are so limited. To just share with you in brief, I think we've discussed this at other opportunities as well. The narrative in the seventh chapter of the book of Esther, where on the face of it, after Haman is unmasked as the enemy, Esther is in the worst possible predicament imaginable. Because after Esther says, in chapter 7, verse 6, an adversary and an enemy, this wicked Haman, the king gets up and leaves. The king arose in his wrath from the banquet of wine and went to the palace garden. And Haman was left there with Esther. And if you just look at that episode, that frame, if you will. What's happened to Esther is the worst possible scenario. She's left there alone with the enemy. 
until, of course, in the very next verse, the king returns and Haman's fate is sealed. There's that brief interval beforehand. Esther doesn't know what's happening. Now consider that our entire lives may be encapsulated in that brief interval. A thousand years for God are as the yesterday that is past. We don't see. We think the king is gone. We think he's just disappeared. We see the wicked prosper. We see the righteous suffer. We see a very, very small part of a vast picture. So, of course, at the very least, on that plane, we appreciate the message of the book of Job and what God says to Job at the end. You just can't see the whole picture. Maybe, perhaps, that is the message also in Exodus chapter 33, verse 23. When God explains to Moses that he cannot see God's essence, he won't be able to see God, as it were, while alive in this world. God gives Moses an alternative level of understanding. He says, I put you in a cleft of the rock. I cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Obviously, these are very, very deep symbols. But in verse 23, then I take away my hand and you will see. Now, the Hebrew can be rendered as my back. But it could also be rendered as you will see what follows from me. You'll see in hindsight. You'll understand in retrospect. But my face shall not, cannot be seen. You won't understand what's taking place until indeed it's already taking place. Now this is all what I would describe as level number one. Level number one, again, is recognizing our limitedness. But there's an additional dimension that I think we need to consider. And that is, when we ask the question, why bad things happen to good people, good things happen to bad people, what we really need to do first is to define our terms, specifically. What is good? And of course, in defining the good, I feel compelled to remind you of something that we have discussed on many occasions in the past, and that is the definition of the good that we get from Asaf. At the end of Psalm 73, in verse 28, as for me, the nearness of God is my good. That's not a prayer, it's a definition. The way I define good is being close to God. Now let's consider what that means then in the enigma of suffering. What that means is the criterion of the good is not going to be material prosperity. The criterion of punishment is not going to be this worldly vexation. There'll be an entirely different way of evaluating. And maybe on that plane, indeed, as well, we consider what God says in Exodus chapter 33, indeed, right before the passage that we read earlier on the page. In verse 19, God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of God before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. I have my considerations. You may never understand them. So, what does that mean in practice? 
in practice, God is gracious to whomever he will be gracious. And God's grace is dispensed freely by God to everyone who can benefit from it. But here's the rub. We might think that material prosperity is the best thing for us. Are we so sure? Remember the verse that we saw in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 about wealth being for a person's birth? And more generally, while we can appreciate that those individuals who are indeed operating at such a level of closeness to God can receive God's blessings, can receive God's gifts, and not in any way be adversely affected. We appreciate that there are people who aren't that close. What do they need to get closer? We have an expression in English, cognitive dissonance. They need to realize that things aren't working out the way they want in order to spur them to grow. So for such individuals, what we might describe as this worldly misery may be the best thing that they could possibly get. It helps them to attain the great good of closeness to God. At the same time, we appreciate likewise that there are other individuals who are at an even lower level and at a lower level experiencing such suffering, such misery may simply lead them to throw in the towel, to forget about God and turn their backs on any kind of spiritual growth. So maybe for such individuals, God bestows blessings that for people at a higher level might be denied. And then, of course, we could speak in this progression of people who are at an even lower level. If they experience any goodness, then what will happen to them is what is described in Deuteronomy chapter 8, beginning in verse 11. Beware, lest you forget God your Lord in not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes which I command you this day, lest when you have eaten and are satisfied and have built good houses and dwell therein, when your herds and flocks multiply, your silver and your gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, that your heart is lifted up and you forget God. So the material blessing at that level will only serve to incite the rebelliousness of saying, as we see in verse 17, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. Forget about God. So for such an individual, once again, the best gift that God can give, and I mean this sincerely, the best gift in order to attain the greatest good, which is closeness to God, is misery, suffering, something that will push him out of the rut that he is in and inspire him to grow. We see the same warning in Deuteronomy chapter 32 when Yeshurun waxed fat, he kicked. So sometimes being denied the fat can be the greatest blessing. Let's consider what that means by way of summation. Someone at this lowest level who, upon experiencing goodness, is going to kick, is going to forget about God, is given by God. Again, what is best for that individual at his present level, which may be suffering misery relentlessly in order to grow. 
And if he grows, attains a higher level of closeness to God, then maybe in particular as means to encouraging him, to bolstering him, God showers him with blessings, with material blessings, with prosperity. And he appreciates this as a gift from God and he grows even higher in his devotions to God. He gets to a level in which he doesn't need the crutch of the prosperity anymore, if anything, on the contrary. He gets to a level at which perhaps God, in assessing what he really needs, decides to plunge him again into misery, withhold all the blessings, because once he gets to a high enough level, we want to spur him to not become complacent, to keep on growing, to keep on coming closer and closer to God. So to the external observer, it makes no sense. When he was at the lowest level, he experienced misery. Now at the higher level, he experiences misery. In the middle, he experienced God's blessings, and now he doesn't anymore. But there's a rule at work, just a rule that we would be hard-pressed to understand or even discern. And that rule, again, in the words of Asaf at the end of Psalm 73, is, for me, nearness to God is the good. Everything else is accessory. There is an additional dimension in this progression as well that we should also stress. And this is perhaps an even lower level than any of the layers that we just described. But it is a profound message with respect to what we observe in this world with respect to reward and punishment. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, we read in verses 9 and 10, Know, therefore, that God your Lord is God, the faithful God, who keeps the, the covenant and kindness with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So again, for those who love God and keep his commandments, God keeps the covenant and kindness. We don't know yet what that kindness is going to mean in practice. In verse 10, and repays them that hate him to their face, to destroy them. He will not be slack to him who hates him, he will repay him to his face. What is that verse describing? Of course, we could say it's describing payment of punishment. I feel compelled to share with you the meaning of this verse in our tradition, which is just the opposite. In verse 10, as opposed to verse 9, the repayment is all about reward. You'll note that in verse 9, the expression payment nowhere appeared. God keeps the covenant and kindness with them. It's a covenant, it's kindness. Nothing about being paid. Because for those who love God and keep his commandments, the payment may never take place in this world. We do, after all, see this world as part of a greater continuum. There's everlasting life, the spiritual world, the world to come. The righteous have their ultimate reward in that spiritual realm. What about the wicked? Well, the wicked have to be repaid because 
most wicked people, at least on occasion, do something good. And it is a cardinal principle of divine justice that no good deed goes unrewarded. And so, God repays them that hate him to their face. To their face, right now, in this world, they get payment. You know why they get payment? First of all, well, the principle we already stated. Because God never withholds payment to any of his creatures for anything that deserves reward. And so, even if the wicked do something that is worthy of reward, God will pay them. But the payment is indeed going to be here and now, in this world. Why? Well, first of all, because someone who really is wicked, even when he does good deeds, does them as basically material acts. They're not really spiritual acts. So reward in a spiritual realm wouldn't be appropriate. Second of all, someone who's really wicked isn't interested in a spiritual realm. He wants to win the lottery right now. He wants to get the fast racing car. He wants to get the big house. He wants to get all the goods now, here, in this world. God obliges. He repays them that hate him to their face. To destroy them. Because having received all their reward in this world, there's nothing left. And what happens to the wicked in the hereafter is the full, complete payment for everything. All of the wickedness, all of the evil that they did in this world. For the righteous, on the contrary, they may experience all of the suffering for the slight misdeeds that they committed in this world so that in the world to come in everlasting life there is nothing but bliss but then of course again our problem is a limited field of view we only see what happens in this world we don't really understand reward and punishment because we don't see the realm of reward and punishment we see a paltry realm of 70, 80 years. What can 70 or 80 years, 120 years be on the scale of divine reward and punishment? So, of course, inevitably, this is also part of the picture. That is, once again, for me, says Asaf at the end of Psalm 73, nearness to God is the good. Nearness to God is the good, and that means that what we get in this world is a reflection of that. Nearness to God is the good in that for the righteous, the full reward isn't in the here and now. It is, rather, the nearness to God in the hereafter. And there's an additional dimension that I feel compelled to stress with you. These are inevitably not so much distinct dimensions. They complement one another, but we don't know the full picture. So I'll share this with you as well. And as much as, after all, the way we come to God in this world, at least one of the ways we come to God, is by looking around at the system that God created. And that system shows to us design. And through the design, we come to the designer. No, this is not any facile proof of God. I'm not proving anything. 
But it is true that when we sense design in the world, it orients us with respect to God, the designer. But now, here's the rub. Design can only be discerned in system. A system is only a system if it is impersonal. Impersonal meaning that it doesn't demonstrate any sensitivity to individuals as righteous or wicked. It's a system. And by consequence, as a result of this impersonal system, the righteous may suffer. As a result of this impersonal system, the wicked may prosper. But again, the importance of having a system lies in that greater, great test, good of nearness to God. If I'm taking that system, that design, as means to connecting with the designer. For the wicked, of course, we already saw. The wicked will simply say, my might and the strength of my hand made me this great host. The system is irrelevant to the wicked. All that's relevant to the wicked is themselves. For the righteous, the system is means for connecting with the one who created it. And that too, irrespective of the this worldly blessings or this worldly suffering, is part of, for me, nearness to God is the good. It's all about that ultimate good, that ultimate good that comes from closeness. There is an additional dimension that I feel compelled to share with you in this regard as well, and that is part of nearness to God means recognizing that we each have a unique opportunity to draw near to God in our lives, in this world. No two people are created with the same mission because no two people are created with the same challenges. And it is specifically by grappling with those challenges that we come to God. Now, in considering those challenges, some people come into the world with grievous handicaps. This isn't by any means an attempt to explain why, because we're not going to understand. But with the realization that that's what's happening in the world, what we certainly appreciate is someone overcoming a handicap and finding that nearness to God as a unique mission is singing as a result a unique song of praise to God that no one else has ever sung or will ever sing in his stead. And when we consider what those challenges imply, it's not at all obvious what kind of challenge is preferable, what kind of challenge is best to be avoided. Just consider in Proverbs chapter 30, in verses 7 and on, the way the author of Proverbs relates to different challenges. Two things have I asked of you, deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with my allotted bread. Neither poverty nor riches. Lest I be full and deny and say, who is God? Or lest I be full poor and steal and take hold of the name of God. 
And either alternative is bad. But either alternative is then an opportunity, a challenge. And that's really what life is all about, isn't it? The challenge of coming near to God. I feel compelled to share with you in this regard also another verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 11. Sweet is the sleep of a laboring man. Whether he eats little or much, but the satiety of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. Sweet is the sleep of a laboring man. In our tradition, alludes to the final sleep. Sleep at the end of the road. After we leave this world. But again, everyone has a unique mission. Sweet is the sleep, whether he eats little or much. What really matters isn't the goodness as we might like it, as me, we might want it. What really matters is the connection, the fulfillment of the mission that enables us to feel the nearness of God. And it's on that plane that I'd just like to conclude. Not really so much with an answer, because we don't have an answer, but nonetheless with an observation. King David in Psalm 4 notes in verse 7, many there are that say, oh, that we could see some good. God, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. And King David's response to that is, you put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and their wine increase. Gladness, happiness is something of the heart. It's something internal. It's a transformation. It's a transformation that results from the realization that there is something immeasurably more valuable than when their produce increases. And thanks to that, that he concludes the psalm, in peace together will I lay me down and sleep. For you, God, make me dwell alone in safety. It's with that realization that indeed we can make our peace. In much the same vein, in Malachi, final chapter of the prophets, in chapter 3 we read of the complaints of people. People who say, it is vain to serve God, and what profit is there that we have kept his charge, and that we have walked mournfully because of the God of hosts. And now we call willful sinners happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are built up. Yea, they test God and are delivered. And the response of the God-fearing, in verse 16, Then they that feared God spoke one with another, and God listened and hearkened, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared God and that thought upon his name. Everyone is shouting their protests out there. And the truth is they have good questions. And if we gauge what we're saying in terms of how good our answers are, we don't have any answers. Indeed, why the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper remains in you. And this entire exercise didn't provide any answers. But I don't think it was a meaningless exercise. Because I think it helped us to appreciate that the real blessing, whatever we experience from God's hand in this world, is the nearness to God coming closer.
through both the suffering and the prosperity, through everything, to see that as the bottom line. And through that, then, to become worthy of God's blessings. God bless you.